So why don't we go ahead and get started since this is being recorded and uh, people can join up as they join up or not, and that's totally fine. Um, so I always watch it later on, I think, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I can go ahead and start with introductions um, and then these wonderful people will introduce themselves and we'll get going on this conversation. Um, so my name is Arpita Panagari. I am the Policy and Partnerships Manager at the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, and I have been lucky enough to work with Amira for the past almost two years on the Young Women's Wellness Leadership Institute, as well as just generally with Beauty Well, her organization. Um, I've also been lucky enough to work with Fatia Tulange and Safiya at different points in time based on the cohort that they were a part of. Um, and I'm really excited for this conversation to be happening at Justice Now because I think that there is so much to learn from Tiwange and Sophia specifically. They have so much to teach you. They have so much knowledge in terms of what they've been able to bring to the Young Women's Wellness Institute. And I'm just excited for them to have this platform. Um, so I can I can throw it on over to Amira. Yeah, thank you, uh, Arpita. My name is Amira Atawe. I am the executive director of the Beardwell uh, Project. Um, and the Beardwell Project is a nonprofit that is based in Minnesota that was founded to combat colorism and, and the skin lighting practices and chemical exposures. But also our work, uh, it's around the intersection of environmental justice, uh, public health and empowering communities to really undo um, uh, the harmful practice of, of skin lighting, uh, but also empowering um, older people, younger people, to make sure that um, communities are healthy on their own identities and redefine what beauty means for them, but also building uh, their health in terms of reproductive health and justice. And, um, and so uh, one of the program now that we have is the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Program. And that is one of the reasons that we uh, created that program is to make sure that young people have um, a space, safe space, but not only that, uh, to train them to have the power to really change uh, these issues around uh, colorism, but also other health issues that are impacting their communities. And so, uh, and so the program, it's a very comprehensive program where, where it includes wellness in terms of reproductive health and reproductive justice, and also um, other health um, uh, sessions and leadership, uh, building young people's leadership so they are uh, ready to advocate and address these uh, underlying issues that impact um, their communities. And the National Institute of Reproductive Health uh, had uh, co-created uh, this with us and, and it has been really great working with Arbita and the rest of the team uh, for the last two years. And now um, uh, we graduated two cohorts and now we're in the third uh, cohorts. Uh, Tuange and Sophia were in the first cohort and Fathe is the program uh, manager. So I'm looking forward to sharing with um, all of you uh, who are participating in this conference uh, uh, that important work and how uh, building youth leadership is so important in combating colorism, but other issues um, as it relates to advocacy and things like that, because we're also advocacy uh, organization that advocate around um, addressing policies that impact uh, communities of color. So thank you, Arbita. Of course. Um, so you heard from Amira a little bit about Beauty Well and why it exists and I'd love it, Amira, if you could talk a little bit about why you think the Young Women's Wellness Leadership Institute is important um, to your community back at home and just generally to have a Young Women's Leadership Institute kind of in the world right now. Mm. It's, it's very important, especially um, in, the, in the African, East African and the Somali communities. Uh, um, it, it's, it's a really important thing because uh, these young uh, girls were born here or like came here very young age 
And so, um, so they don't fully fit in their uh, uh, culture of origin and don't fully fit in in the American culture. And so in the schools, in the American system in schools, um, there's so much um, bullying that happened in terms of colorism, but also uh, there's so much identity issues. If you don't fully uh, 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 belong to that place or that school or even that uh, environment, so, so, so identity crisis always happens to everybody who um, experienced that, uh, experienced not welcomed. And so, so we have created this program to make sure that these young girls have a chance to um, have safe space, to be who they are, uh, to accept themselves and, um, and also learn these um, uh, important informations that were not available to them in the schools, uh, wellness, reproductive health, uh, and other uh, wellness uh, areas were not uh, available to them in the school. Some of these schools don't even have health classes. And so, and then also how do we make sure that we build young people from younger age uh, and, 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 and build them uh, um, their leadership, but also give them representation. You know, as part of the program that we are so intentional is to introduce them women of color that look like them, whether they come and present in sessions, uh, but also uh, how do we make sure that they get these mentorship, one-on-one um, uh, uh, -on -one mentoring by women of color who are in positions of leadership or, uh, or have a career um, that, that they're uh, well uh, established. And that, that's not available. I mean, it does not come easily um, to, to the young people, but also it's not only teaching them, but how do we make sure that they come up with projects, projects that they can present wherever um, they go, uh, projects that they can talk to their legislators, council members around what impact is their uh, communities, especially in the issue of colorism. Um, colorism, it's, it's a huge, huge issue that it's a global issue that stems from colonization and, and, and slavery, that people were told that they're not beautiful enough, they're not good enough if they're not beautiful. So that's really um, uh, embedded in cultures and systems. And so I think young people having that leadership and power to actually address issues like that. In this case, colorism is such an important uh, thing. And the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative gives them that space to be creative, to have the safe space and, and, and the support system that they need to develop what they want to develop and advocate uh, for. Thanks so much. It is, I've been lucky enough to visit the cohorts in person. I got to see Tuanga and Sophia in person. And I've been able to virtually visit other cohorts and it has been so incredible to watch these young women in the space together and really learning from one another and learning from Amira. And it's, um, I, am, I feel very grateful to be working with, with these women. Um, so in terms of the structure here today, I'm gonna throw this over to Fati and Fati Tuange and Sophia will all present for a few minutes on you know some of the things that they've learned in the Young Women's Wellness Leadership Institute and the projects that they've created and then we'll do kind of some panel questions and then if participants have questions uh, we'll address those at the end so to Fati. Okay, hi everybody so uh, myself Twange and Sophia will be sharing about the incredible projects that they did around colorism um, so I'll share my screen so you can do that. Um, so first I'll be talking about the importance of youth advocacy and youth voice in addressing issues, um, particularly issues around colorism. Um, and I wanna start with the fact that youth have been and continue to be knowledgeable and capable change agents in society from um, historically. And then we've even seen it uh, more recently in large number and meaningful ways in the Black Lives Matter movement. We've also seen it in our program in the ways that um, youth have worked to address issues of colorism through the Black and Color campaign um, and through video projects that I'll share momentarily. 
Um, and in these campaigns and projects, youth were able to combat colorism and that directly, they directly speak to young people, they share their stories and they uplift others that look like them. Um, and in these projects that both Tawange and Safiya were a part of, um, they inspired other girls who look like them to love their black skin, to redefine beauty and to show the importance of embracing their black skin. Um, and then we also know that youth to youth educational messages are received best by youth. So youth are more likely to listen to other youth who look like them, who experience the same things as them, um, who also have the same values as them. This is why it's particularly powerful to have young girls like Tawange and Safiya uh, be a part of the process of addressing colorism, to speak to other young girls. And um, you'll see that in the projects that I'll share soon. Um, and youth also know the best language and medium to use. So youth know the best language to speak to other young people. Um, and they also know best mediums to use um, in the sense that youth are very familiar with digital spaces and social media and they use creative ways to reach other youth in that way. Um, and we will also see that in the projects that I'll share soon as well. Um, and we've also learned from the program, the Young Women Wellness and Leadership Program, that when youth are given a safe space, such as this program, and an opportunity, youth know and can speak with knowledge and experience to address issues of colorism um, from their own voices, through their own leadership. And I will share those now. Um, so this is one of those projects. And in this project, um, youth were able to um, come up with messages and ideas and projects. And this whole project, of, which is a video project where they um, talked about not just educational and awareness raising videos, but also uplifting messages that say that um, you're beautiful, your blackness is beautiful. And um, they chose issues that particularly impact them, such as colorism. Um, and then this educational video was about mental health. Um, and then this other video, that other project that I would like to share that Tawage and Safiya were a part of is the Black in Color project, which was um, another project that the girls came up with on their own that has their voices and their ideas. Um, and it, they made this to address colorism and self-esteem. Um, and each of the girls, they came up with the idea of doing self portraits where um, there was a picture taken of them and their skin and they chose a color that um, that represents them that they like and such as Tuange who is here today uh, who chose this beautiful neon color to show that um, dark skin looks beautiful even with bright colors and to dismantle that myth that uh, dark skin and bright colors can't go together um, and each of them talked about themselves in this quote and um, in really powerful ways where they define themselves and they define beauty for themselves um, and showed why their blackness is beautiful, um, such as Tuange here, the quote that she says, where she says, don't let others define you by their ideal looks, be comfortable in your own skin. And she's ended with proudly a brown skin girl, which I think is very powerful and amazing. And um, this is another example of another girl who is in the program um, who wrote this beautiful quote that says her multi-dimensional and intersectional identity, her name, she, her, she's a daughter, she's the second youngest, she's a basketball player, she's confident and showing that she can be all of these things and also a Somali girl and also a black girl. And I think this idea of embracing the multi um, intersectional identities that these girls have and having a safe space to express that allows other girls who look like them who see this to also do that for themselves. Um, and so I just wanted to share this to show an example of the amazing things that young people are capable of when they're given a safe space and an opportunity to do so. Um, and then next I'll pass it on to Sophia. Hi everyone. My name is Sophia Mohammed, and I am a first year student in college. And I joined the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative in uh, summer of 2019. And as a um, journalism student, it's really helped me find my voice, not only within my field, but within other parts of my life as well. So one main focus that I want to talk about today in terms of how it's helped me is storytelling and using storytelling as a tool of advocacy. So the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative helped me find my voice as a young woman of color. It helped me dig deep inside myself and 
find the words to tell my story and channel it through the right avenues. Learning about skin lighting practices and combating them taught me about, taught me how to go about advocacy work within marginalized communities. So oftentimes as a writer, as a journalist, I might see things through one lens, you know, such as an objective lens or wanting to go about something a certain way, but learning about the practice of skin lighting within my own Somali community taught me that you have to approach various problems through a certain way. And with, um, within my own community, there are some things that I'm probably gonna do in terms of advocacy and how I'm gonna go about teaching people a problem and teaching people about skin lighting and how detrimental it can be. And the Young Women's Leadership, the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative gave me the tools, resources, and confidence to succeed. As I stated before, it helped me find my voice, but it helped me, it also helped me create connections with other women of color and other young girls of color who are passionate and like-minded and are driven to create, a, to create change within our communities. And it helped, edu helped me educate myself about colorism within my own community and how I can be a part of eradicating the process and taking part in change. So growing up, I always noticed that a lot of people in my community, especially a lot of older folks and even some young girls my age would try to lighten their skin, use um, skin lighting creams and do so many other things that were really detrimental to their skin, but they believed they were doing the right thing. And um, at first I never really thought much about it, but once I joined the program, I learned about how detrimental it is and how it can leave um, lasting impacts on one's skin and one's health. And it taught me about the reasons why people do it and how I can be a part of um, getting rid of that practice and ending the stigma around embracing people's, uh, people embracing their natural skin tone. And uh, the wellness group also helped me learn about the experiences of other young girls, the experiences of other young girls of color and how we have very similar stories, but each of our stories are also unique to our own experiences. And um, through the group, I learned about the importance of investing in young people and equipping them with the tools to create change within their own environments through social media, advocacy training, and teaching young people that their narratives are powerful. Um, being part of the group taught me that I have a story to tell and I can go about it however I please. And it also gave me the tools and resources to be able to tell that story. And the um, group also helped me affirm that, you know, I am a part of the future and young people as a whole are a part of the future. And I too have a voice that can be utilized for change. And I think that that's a really powerful message to hear as a young person. And it really is a um, foundational step that a lot of young people need to hear in order to um, create change, in order to become passionate and invested in um, making the world a better place. Hi, um, my name is Tiongi Kafla. I'm a first year student at St. Mary's University. I'm majoring in biology pre-med and I have participated in Young Women's Awareness in 2019 and I graduated. I'm now um, a member of advisory board and Young Women's Awareness has helped me gain confidence about my skin color because growing up, I have always felt that dark skins were not attractive and for me, um, like to feel appreciated and to fit in, I was wanting like to look different because everybody, that's what everybody was doing, like having a fair skin and dark skin was always like looked down upon. But once I started like being part of the young women's awareness, I was shocked to see like some, you know, it's, it's bad to be using like those creams to write in your skin. And it was like a place of comfort for me. Like I feel appreciated. And that's how I started to gain confidence. Oh, wow. 
So I, I am beautiful in that I can represent um, other people who have the same skin as me to feel the same way. And that's how I go about like educating other people also that they should um, feel good in their own skin. And I share my experience with Beauty World and about how they educated me about the dangers of using the skin lighting product because that's the like the most thing that people use in my community growing up, especially in Africa. Uh, those creams like they get bad a lot. And so I since I learned that from Beauty World, I try to share it with others as well. And Beauty World has also helped me to navigate um safe personal care product using skin deep up so like they give us an example of how the other hand i was preferred than the other one and how it was safer so and other like makeup stuff to like to be aware which um makeup contains make your and how to avoid that and it was really helpful because i was using like all kinds of makeup from different stores without knowing what's in it and having somebody showing you that oh you have to make sure you check the ingredients and know what that means make sure that yourself it was really helpful for me and with that I start with we, we started advocating against carousing through social media and we did the PowerPoint and I thought it was really good because not only it boosted me, but I feel like it also helped other people because there was this thing, ideology that um, bright colors don't look good on a dark skin. And we we're trying to prove that point that no, you can be a dark skin girl or person, but still look good with whatever you wear, whether it's dark or bright colors everything can look good on it and you don't have to change yourself to fit in and young women was like a place uh, that I feel like my voice was heard and I could like voice some opinion and express how I felt and I didn't feel judged it felt self for me so I would like really recommend other people to join as well because it also helped me like deal with stress because I was a senior in high school and just having a program where I could go to every other sessions, every sessions. And uh, we will have like a session where they will teach you like how to deal with stress or like assignments and all that. And having to deal with like a mental breakdown it really like helped me to push through my senior year and also like meeting other people who are leaders. It motivated me to like push harder and like work through my dreams. So yeah, I really appreciate the program. Over to you, Arbuta. Great. Um, so I am going to go ahead and ask some questions of everybody. Thank you so much, Fati, Tuange, and Sophia for uh, presenting on what it's meant, you know, what your participation with the YWWLI has been. Um, so my first question is for all of you. Um, you've all kind of talked about, you know, what it means to have young people power and what it's meant to you to participate in the YWWLI. But I guess I wondered, you know, what's been the most rewarding part for you participating in this? Um, and that includes you, Amira and Fati, um, especially as you, Tuwanga and Sophia, have gone to college since participating in the initiative. And then what is something that you've learned from each other, from the initiative, from Amira and Fatih, or Fatih and Amira from Tuonga and Sophia, what is something that you've learned throughout this process that you take with you in your daily life or in your education or with your family? What are some things that are like the take home messages for you? 
I, um, I personally, you know, uh, uh, it's just so amazing getting to know all of these young uh, girls who are extremely smart and very creative and just um, like Fatih said, just, uh, you know, them having that opportunity to just shine and, and work on things that they're passionate on and, and learn. Uh, it's just so amazing to witness all of that and and world full of negativity to see that positive side and how do we actually amplify uh, that voice uh, more than even their project is how do we bring them to uh, spaces like this conference or other places to really amplify their messages is is um, some of the things that, you know, just their creativity is some of the things that I have learned myself and just um, uh, uh, made me even um, uh, think about how can we even expand and, and, and include, uh, maybe create other cohorts and all of that to just um, expand and have other people experience uh, the same way. Um, for me personally, it was my takeaway was that um, I can achieve um, my dreams no matter how dark my skin is and that my skin doesn't determine my future. And seeing all these leaders with the same skin color kind of like keeps me going because especially in my society, there's this thing that people say that if your skin is not right, then there's low chances that you're going to be having a like high paying jobs or having the job you really wanted, like because some jobs require to look a certain way. But having this program made me realize that, you know, it's not like that. You can still achieve your goals and everything, no matter um, what you look like. My takeaway message from this, uh, participating in this group is I have the power and the means to create change within my own community. I know that a lot of the times, you know, when people think of uh, change making on a much larger scale, they think of large groups and um, people coming together to facilitate that. And while that is important, a lot of the times we forget that we have, you know, the means and resources um, to go about creating change and even our own um, passion and drive within ourselves can be a tool for change. So the group really helped me um, find that within myself and it's something that I try to remind myself of every day. Amazing, yeah. And one thing that is always amazing for me to also see um, during these cohorts is the growth, see the growth from the girls from the beginning of the cohort until the end during the graduation and seeing how much they've learned and how much personal growth that has occurred with them. And then also listening to the speeches that their girls do at the end to see the impact that program, this kind of program had on them. That is something that is really rewarding and really amazing to see during every cohort. And then um, one thing I learned is the limitless potential that these young girls have. Every day they amaze me, and especially with their end of program projects, incredible, incredibly amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me the phrase limitless potential. <laughs> what a beautiful way to describe what this project is. Um, next, specifically to Tuange and Sophia, um, can you talk a little bit about the process of getting involved with the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Institute or initiative? And, you know, what did your parents or your guardians um, think of the program? I ask this because I myself come from a South Asian immigrant family and first generation American. And uh, my parents were very strict when I was growing up and I'm not sure how they would have felt about me being in a space where you're talking openly and honestly about things like healthy relationships and sexual and reproductive health. Um, so um, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit just about the process of getting involved, what, what did your family think of the program and how did it feel to be with, in a space with other young women who are of your same or sim similar cultural background? What did it feel like to spend time in that space? 
So for me, I first learned about the program when I met Amira. She came to my high school um, the last day of my junior year. And um, she told me about uh, this program that she was developing for young Somali girls and East African girls to help combat colorism and help um, you know, young women build their self-confidence in their network. And when I told my mother about it at first, she, you know, she didn't know what to make of it because there just weren't any groups out there for um, young Somali girls and she, and young East African girls. And you know, she it was a first for her. But um, she came to our first meeting as a cohort, and um, uh, after being there and talking to the girls and seeing how you know, I was actively participating, she kind of came to the conclusion that it was, you know, it was a good fit for me and um, that uh, it, was, it was something that I could take part in and really learn from. For me, I got connected to my guardian and um, she asked me if I was interested and it sounds so interesting to me that, oh, okay, yes, I am. So I emailed Amir and then I started attending the first session and a lot about me changed all of a sudden, like I started loving myself and I was like bubbly. And so they loved it because I, that's where like I found joy and it felt like I, it felt like family, yeah. And so, yeah, I loved it and they loved it and I kept going so that's how it went about it that makes me so happy i very distinctly remember you both sophia and tulange from when jenny my coworker, and i came to the young women's wellness leadership initiative and sophia i remember you were so passionate and you were so like wanting to be there and um you had ideas right off the bat even though this was pretty early on in the very first cohort and Tiwange, you sat at Jenny and my table and you were asking us questions about college and you were asking about your future. And I was just so thrilled to see how invested you both were kind of from jump. And Sophia, to be honest, when I saw that your mom was there, I was like, oh my gosh, because I knew Jenny and I were talking and I was like, oh gosh, I hope we don't say the wrong thing. I know how much it means to especially moms from, from immigrant backgrounds to, to have approval over what their kids are doing, especially their daughters. And so I'm glad that, I'm glad that at the end of the day, she was very excited about it. I just want to add about Sophia's comment about a program like that was never in existence. Uh, that, that's absolutely true. And that, mm -hmm. that was very common uh, amongst the mothers. It wasn't only Sophia's mother when mm -hmm. I, all the mothers they're like yeah we have never heard something like this this is really good but we just want to know how it goes <laughs> like Sophia's mom she came and experimented you yeah know? <laughs> yeah and uh, there were other moms who were asking me to check in with them so often uh, that was also uh, the case with the second cohort, but now mm -hmm. uh, the mothers are, are a bit of a relaxed now because um, the program has been in establishment now for a while. Mm -hmm. And so, and they hear, you know, communities are word of mouth, you know, um, the communities that we work with. So they hear the good things about the program, not only the good things, but how young girls are, um, uh, are being developed within this program you know, what they're gaining, all of that. So I think um, it has raised an awareness that was not there before, because mm -hmm. parents have seen only young boys get youth programs, but mm -hmm. not type of um, programs for uh, young girls. Yeah, that's actually the perfect segue to my next question, because I know, Amira, that you've developed relationships, different types of relationships with the mothers, especially as new cohorts have have come up, come along. And I know that we've spent time talking about, you know, how can we make sure the mothers feel involved and how can we make sure that, you know, they feel safe sending their daughters to this program. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how you connect with the mothers. And Fatih, you too, 
Um, and why do you think this particular connection between you and Fatih and the mothers of the young women is important to the health of the program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a that's a great question, uh, Arbita. It's a very important, um, as you have mentioned before. Um, you know, this is a very cultural uh, community. People know each other, even if they don't know each other. Um, things, you know, like are you know, like word of mouth thing. You know, like words go f so fast, and so and so. Uh, um, developing a relationship and trust with the mother is such an important and it's important for the success of the program because if there is no buy-in you know from from the parents then it will be difficult for us to do the work we do even if we have really solid relationship with the schools i mean at the end of the day it's the parents especially mothers who approve and so it, it was very important uh, for me to develop that relationship with with the mothers, I mean, uh, the second cohort. I mean, the the mothers were extremely involved. I remember at some point, uh, Fati and I telling them to not come to the sessions. I mean, not that they wanted to sacrifice <laughs> their girls, but they just wanted themselves too to have that kind of space. <laughs> <laughs> so, so because some of them were dropping, you know, like uh, the. The second uh, cohort, half of it was uh, in person. It was right before COVID, and then when COVID started, we we moved to virtual. So so when they drop off their daughters, they wanted just to stay, and we're like, no, no, we need to close the room. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's not gonna happen. So so we had this process for them to check in with them um, once a month you know, and, and tell them. And then at the end, when the program ended, we did focus group session uh, for them. Fatih and I did focus group session for them to just check in, you know, how they felt uh, their girls going through this program all of these weeks. And, and also what we learned, you know, to give them a feedback, um, not exactly disclosing, uh, because it's a safe space again you know some of the things that young girls share we don't tell their parents we just try to tag that information and if there is a problem to solve it without telling directly uh, the uh, the parents and so uh, we gave them some uh, feedback and they really loved actually the third cohort some of the recruitments came from uh, the previous parents talked to other parents and said this is this is really uh, important program. And I just also want to say uh, how Fatih is so amazing. I mean, Fatih does really amazing work, uh, you know, with, with the girls and with the mothers too. I mean, she responds to them right away. Uh, and, and I know Fatih will talk about this, but I just want to give the credit to Fatih too, how she is, um, you know, like connected to parents, but also uh, to the young girls. And so I think, you know, that um, bonding and relationship development with the parents is such an important part for the program. Yes, thank you, Amira. Um, and I also want to say, particularly what you said, Arbita, about immigrant parents being a little more protective of their daughters. That's very true. And um, so it's really, really important mm -hmm. to build trust with the parents and to have like complete buy-in from them. Um, so in the beginning of the cohort, when we were doing recruitment, it was really important for me to speak to the parents, particularly the mothers, answer their questions, if they had um, concerns, answer that, completely explain the program to them, um, let them know that me and Amira are both available um, to them if they have any further questions and to um, build that kind of trust with them and have open communication with the parents. And I think that is really important, particularly with our community. and for having the girls to be able to come to the program and have the permission of the parents to do so requires having trusting relationship with their parents. Yeah, I'm so glad that you both talked about that. I, I think that, and that Sophia and Tonga, you talked about how your parents and guardians felt about sending you to the program. I think that that is such a, it's such a part, it's such a component of like the cultural specificity of the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative that I think is so important for folks who maybe are thinking about starting this in their own communities, which I hope that this is gonna inspire people to do. I think 
you know, I know Amira, when, when we were first talking about this before the first cohort, I think we talked about the mothers maybe once or twice, and now they're kind of a mainstay in our conversations about the program because it is really important to ensure that they feel involved, Fatsy, just like you said. I, you know, I so appreciate the perspective that you guys bring on that and and the learning and growth that's happened over the past few cohorts for sure. Um, so you guys did mention how now it's virtual because of COVID. And I guess I wanna hear a little bit more about, about what it's like to, to be doing the YWWLI virtually um, what's different, what's the same. And then Tiwanga and Sophia, you're young women in college right now <laughs> during COVID. So I wonder if you guys could share a little bit about what is that like? What is it like to be, you know, virtual learning and, and, and you know, going to college, but maybe not feeling the same sense of community that you expected to feel? I'm really interested to hear about kind of this, the the COVID world and the effect on both the program and you two as young women. Yeah, um, just like anybody, I mean, transitioning from uh, in-person to virtual, uh, it, when we started doing that back in March, it was a couple of weeks of, um, you know, a kind of uh, transition process. One, because of, you know, uh, the young girls uh, were not prepared uh, to either do distance learning, you know, in the school, but also joining programs virtually. I mean, some of them did not have a laptop or, um, uh, you know, active internet. And so, so that was a bit of a transition um, for the young girls. Uh, most of them had uh, devices that they can join. The beauty about Zoom is that you can also join through your cell phone. So, uh, so that was... Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, so that was very helpful. Uh, but also we had to restructure and to make sure that um, we, you know, like, um, like we like kept, you know, like our sessions the way it was, but also switched to more of a virtual uh, thing. You know, we kept uh, the same number of uh, uh, speakers, same number of sessions, and it went really, really well. And the other thing is that, you know, the girls were not going to school. They didn't have, you know, other things that they were doing. And so that was a really great safe space for them. And then during that time, uh, late spring, it was when George Floyd was killed, it, you know, like the whole civic unrest happened in Minnesota. And so mm -hmm. that was also another great um, time. I mean, sad time, you know, um, I, I'm sorry for what happened to George Floyd, but it was, um, moment of time for the young girls also to have that connection you know because mm -hmm. of they were going through both COVID and also the civic unrest to have that space for them was very important and um and we were able to successfully graduate them you know um luckily it was summertime we could host you know graduation party uh, physically distancing, wearing mask, and so, <laughs> and so we were able to really readjust really all of that. And then now uh, the third cohort, it's going very well. And actually, we did a little bit more adjustment, gave them more of a, a break time to in, mm -hmm. in between, uh, uh, you know, like sessions within um, within that uh, weekly, the weekly Friday um, sessions. And then also, um, um, also we decreased the time, uh, screen time by half an hour. And so now, uh, so, so we have them uh, like hour and a half before it was two hours. So that hour and a half, we were still able to do what we're supposed to do because we don't want to have uh, them on Zoom for two full hours because that actually changes the, the the attention and all of that. And so it's just going really amazing. And every day when we are ending, we go over time and Fatih will talk about that because of the excitement and how, and then now we have 14 young girls. It's double, almost double of what we used to have. And so it's just so amazing. Yes, I'll just say thank God for Zoom. <laughs> it has been so helpful to have some way that the girls can connect through their phone and for it to be accessible in that way for all of the girls. 
Um, but then also we had to use creativity to change some of the activities that we had in person and um, some of the things that we usually did in person to online. And so like learning different Zoom functions to use to still bring in that interactive activities that we had in person um, before COVID, bring it here. We also have a really amazing youth advisory board that advises us on the best ways to do the sessions virtually. And they've been extremely helpful, both Tuange and Sophia and other girls are a part of that in advising us and helping us to do it in the best way, to do the cohorts virtually in the best kind of way. And um, so that has been really helpful to have. So thank you to Tuange and Sophia for that. For me, I think it's like super convenient since like I'm in college far from St. Paul and I like I can just join from here instead of like um, going there. So I feel like it's helpful that it's online now and it's very accessible for you. Yeah, so <clears throat> for me, it's it's been a challenge adjusting to doing college online and you know not being able to have the space to really get out there and get to meet people and um, it's it's been hard but I've been finding ways to make the most of it and to try to connect with as many people as possible. I, yeah, I really admire the both of you for taking this kind of on the chin and, and just going with the flow. I don't, I don't know if I would have been as graceful about virtual learning as you two seem to be. Um, and can you, can you guys talk a little bit about your part of the kind of inaugural advisory board for, for the YWWLI? And when Amira was, was talking about this idea, you two did immediately come to my mind as two people who would definitely be able to work to make this program better and better for the people who came after you. So can you talk a little bit about what it is like to be on the advisory board? What are your duties? What, what are the things that you wanna to bring to the table in terms of how you think the YWWLI could be even better for, for next cohorts? Um, I just share like my experience and what I like about the program and also like encourage other um, participants like not not to stress out about it like just like have fun with it enjoy it while you grow with it and yeah and also like we um, share our ideas about why they should like still do that they did with us which like we think it was it really like help us grow so yeah. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> to add to that, we also um, brainstorm different uh, topics and things that we can, um, that Amira and uh, Fethi can uh, address within each session. Uh, we sometimes meet with the girls, give them advice on how to navigate this program and you know just life advice in general. And basically we are sort of a support system almost for the Young Women's Wellness Group. And uh, we try to help, um, we bring a, a more, you know, a different perspective, a perspective of people who've gone through the program and um, how we can elevate it and change it for the better. Yeah, I just want to mention a um, couple of weeks ago, uh, Sophia and Fatih spent with, with the girls uh, who are in the process of applying college for four hours. Sophia, would you like to talk about that? that oh that's... my gosh, Sophia, where to bury the lead? My goodness. Yeah, so um, uh, Fatih reached out to me and asked if I could, you know, help out some of the, or some of the young girls in the group who were seniors in high school and were navigating the college process. And um, I was more than happy to help. I went in there, you know, hoping that I would, you know, give them advice, 
uh, point them to the right direction, tell them about, you know, what to do and what not to do, and about financial aid, scholarships, and, uh, you know, things of that sort. But I was also very surprised that uh, most of these girls already knew what I was telling them. They had, you know, all of this down. They really had it all figured out. And um, yeah, it was it was great to be that, you know, uh, to be helpful to them and to give them that kind of support and advice. But I, I feel like they're all very smart, bright young girls and they had it all figured out, to be honest, even without my help. Sophia is being very, very modest, extremely modest. <laughs> she was so helpful. Um, she also received a Fulbright scholarship from her college. And Sophia! She, right? <laughs> Tawange did too. Tawange also. Tawange too? Yes. Good guys. Right. Yes. And Amazing. she... Yes, amazing. And she was helping the girls to figure out how to get scholarships for college and would like share links into the chat and tell them specifically step by step how to do it from her own personal experience and gave such amazing advice from her personal experience, which I think was more powerful to the girls than reading articles or having an advisor at school tell them about these things. Mm -hmm. Telling it from her experience was so powerful and helpful to the girls, which is why it took all of four hours. <laughs> When we thought it would take 30 minutes because Sophia was so generous in sharing information and advice to the girls. That was really, really helpful. I love that. And I love these kind of offshoots from just being part of the program. You now are part of advising the girls on this and part of this advisory group. And Tuonga and Sophia, you guys got full rides to college. That is so incredible and something to be so proud of. And oh my God, I could start crying. I Oh God, I just love this program so much. Um, so for Fatih and Amira, I wanted to ask, what do you hope to see as the Young Women's well Wellness and Leadership Initiative continues to grow? What, you know, Amira, I know that in your early conversations with Jenny and since I've kind of taken over and been working with you, we've been talking about cultural shifts. We've been talking about what this could mean for your community where you are in the Twin Cities, but also just generally for, for other East African communities of young women who are, who are trying to make something like this happen for themselves. So what do you wanna see as, as more and more cohorts become involved and what kind of big cultural shift are you hoping for these young women to lead? Because you know they joined the Leadership Institute to to open up that leadership potential. And my God, if, if anyone has learned anything, it's that Tuanga and Sophia are great examples of what it looks like to, to walk into yourself as a leader. And so I'm just, you know, what, what do you think? What do you think this could, this could lead to? What do you think these young women can do? Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, these are great questions, uh, Arbeta. So I think, you know, the hope is that to continue what we're doing uh, to, you know, keep recruiting uh, these amazing young girls, uh, you know, keep doing what we're doing, creating these safe spaces uh, for them and the learning and building uh, their leadership, but also us learning from them because they have so much, you know, they can offer to us to learn uh, from them. In terms of cultural shift, you know, some of these issues, uh, especially in the issue of uh, skin lighting, you know, it's it's a, it's a very stigma taboo and these are some of the things that you know uh, communities never talked about um and so these young girls are coming out you know talking about these issues and and it, it's a their lived experience it if it didn't happen to them it happened to their family members or somebody that they know their friends and so you know um sharing issues you know like or addressing issues that, that are stigma Within, within the communities, but also identifying um, issues that, um, that are happening within the community that nobody talks about. Like the last cohort, they did um, mental health uh, video, youth mental health. You know, mental health is something that very stigma uh, within the Somali East African communities. And so, um, and so them talking about that and, and, you know, like uh, substance use and things like that, that was really uh, amazing. So, so we want to see, you know, in terms of cultural shift, um, um, 
these young girls to identify some of these underlying issues in their communities and lead in the future because we want them to lead this after they're done with the with the program with our support they we want them to lead and and um, whether it's that what um uh, Twenge and Sophia are now doing uh, in college. Uh, um, Sophia haven't talked about much of, of herself. I mean, during the civic unrest, she has been writing articles about, you know, like Minnesota nice issues and racial issues within this state. So, so things like that. We want them to do a lot of uh, cultural shift and 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 talk about issues that have never talked about within the community. And we're seeing that now. We have been in the process of helping young girls to identify uh, um, uh, pro their project is this current cohort. And we're seeing, you know, um, their thoughts, ideas, and how they want to create a cultural shift within the community. But he and yes. yeah, I agree. I completely agree with what Amira said. Um, the only other thing I would add is to also have the girls embrace and love their own skin and to see themselves as leaders and um, to have that soft growth and to have the idea of uh, dismantling the idea of colorism starting from themselves. And I think that's a big part that we also want to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think you're well on your way there. I'm, you know, just from what I've seen of each cohort that's come through the program, it's been really incredible. Um, and to Tuangi and Sophia. To oh, yeah. yeah. So in terms of, you know, like, uh, so, so the girls in terms of when they're selecting project is, it's not even something that we tell them to talk about colorism or skin light. It comes from them. Now we have mm -hmm. a whole group who is working on that. Uh, so it's it's a, it's something that, as I mentioned, it's their lived experience colorism in the schools. You know, because colorism it's not even only external, but also within groups. And mm -hmm. so they just also want to dismantle these ideologies. Uh, for themselves, but also uh, younger uh, people too. Yeah, that's a great point. This is coming like organically to the girls in each cohort. And I think that's so important. Um, so Tiwange and Safiya, Amira has touched on this a little bit, but I think especially during the protests around George Floyd, Something that we saw was young Somali people, including young Somali women on the front lines of protecting their community during the protests. Um, and I think it's really a powerful message about young people power. And so to you two, kind of what message do you wanna to send to people who are looking for a space like what the Young Women's Wellness and Leadership Initiative provided to you? And what do you think young people power means? What do you think young people can do to change their communities? So I would say to young people who are looking to create those spaces or create that kind of change to, you know, just create those spaces for themselves and for other young people. Um, a lot of the times we talk about, you know, having a seat at, at the table and, you know, um, being included in those kinds of initiatives in the larger conversation. And while I think that's important, it is also important to remember that, um, we have the power and the ability to create our own tables and to, you know, be inclusive of everyone who wants to sit with us, who wants to take part in what we're doing. And I think young people who want to create that kind of change and facilitate that kind of change should uh, take heed of that and try to, you know, make something of their own. And um, could you repeat the last part of your question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> what what do you think young people power means? What do you think young people can do to to change their communities? Um, I think that young people can one start with themselves and you know look within, find that voice, find the um, story within you that you want to tell, and you know channel it however you want, and um, do your best to. 
uplift others around you with your story and um, be inclusive of those that, you know, you um, might feel like your stories align and relate together in some ways, but also those that are different from you because we all deserve to, you know, be a part of the larger conversation and we all deserve to have the ability to tell our own stories. Um, for me, if, if you're looking like for a place where you feel like you belong and like for the young, I feel like young voices matters. And if you wanna feel heard without being judged, young women awareness is for you. And it's like a space like you'll be able to express yourself and speak up based on your experience and it can turn into like a big thing because I didn't know that like speaking about charism would turn into a presentation. We're just having a discussion about like how things are going in school and how like people think about like dark skin and bright colors. And that conversation and us expressing ourselves that how we like afraid to wear bright colors because we're afraid of being judged. But then we start like discussing it and expressing how we feel like, oh, we can turn it into a presentation and then like um, spread more awareness about it. So like, it's a safe place for you to be yourself. Yeah, um, I love that you said, uh, both of you said safe place. And Tiwange, I see you rocking the bright colors. And can I just say, amazing. <laughs> and you should keep doing it. And that's exactly what it looks like to be gaining, you know, the self confidence and self esteem from, from your community. Um, I have one last question. And then if any participants have questions, feel free to chat them in or use the QA feature. Um, but my last question is, how do you think that you're going to use what you've learned in the Young Women's Leadership and Young Women's Wellness Leadership Initiative through being in community with one another? How do you think you're going to use all that you've learned at school, in your home, with your family and friends? Um, and this question is also for Amira and Fatih because I know that you all learn from the young people as well. Um, I think I will use a lot of the uh, tools and lessons that I learned from the Young Women's Wellness Initiative. I uh, talked a lot about advocacy and uh, that is something that I learned from the group and um, I've been able to find my voice and to improve my uh, overall communication skills. So that is something that I definitely know that I'm going to be using, especially as someone who wants to go into journalism. I know that, you know, communication and advocacy and being able to tell a story in a powerful and moving way is very important. And um, the Young Women's Wellness Initiative really helped me um, find those, find that voice within me and find those tools to be able to tell it. Um, I try like, to include it in my classes, presentation or like writing classes. For example, my uh, anchor course, what is your story? So I talk about like how I got into the program and what we did. And I feel like I should just like keep doing it because I feel like most students like, uh, like they get interested to know more about it after like I do a presentation about it. Oh, that's so cool. Like that, there's that program that exists um, for you to feel good about yourself. So I think I will continue doing that since I feel like it's actually spreading awareness. So yeah. Yeah, um, the way that I will use is that, I mean, this is a very participatory process, the way I look at it, you know, um, um, young people, young girls are learning from us, but we're also learning from them. I myself learning a lot from them. So um, using that to actually modify the, the uh, you know, the future cohorts 
but also uh, amplifying, you know, their voices. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, you know uh, what impacts them and their, you know, their lived experience. So how do we amplify their voices? So one of the thing is that um, for the last three years, I had a radio show, and now it's shifting to a podcast called The Young. Uh, it's a Beer and Wellness Talk, and so. One of the um, episodes that now I'm working on is lift experience, you know, lift experience of um, colorism, but also lift experience of uh, uh, them living in this country. Uh, what does that mean? You know, being a black person, immigrant, um, or we're born uh, here, but having a parent of, of immigrant. And so um, talking about, you know, these different stories of lift experience and including some of the youth voices uh, in there. Uh, so that is uh, some of the ways that uh, I am using what I'm learning from uh, the young girls. Yeah, and every session, every time that we have a session, I learned something new from the girls. I mean, you're right, it's a two-way thing. We're teaching them things, but they're also teaching us a lot about themselves and particularly about issues um, and things that they experience or that are important to them. And um, so I'm learning that. And like Amiri said, from the last cohort, implementing that into the new cohort. And I plan to continue that with future cohorts. Um, and so that is something that I learn every time from them. Thank you all so much for, for answering these questions, for talking to us about the young women. Wellness and Leadership Institute, I myself feel very um, humbled by being able to work with you all. I, you know, the National Institute for Reproductive Health, we work with a number of partners every year and Amira knows this certainly, but the number of times working with Beauty Well has made me cry is unacceptable, truly unacceptable. I feel so strongly about this work, especially as the daughter of immigrants and a first generation American, um, this space would have, would have changed my life. And I'm happy with how my life is now, obviously, but I'm so glad that young women have a space like this and that they have mentors in Amira and Fati who are, ch you know, you're changing lives and Sophia and Tawanga, you're giving back. And I am so in awe of each of you. Um, I just want to add something about the National Institute of Reproductive Health. I just want to publicly mention that we wouldn't have done this program uh, without the support that you guys give, give to us. Um, we had the idea, but not uh, the support, the resources actually to establish it. So we are very grateful uh, for your support and continuous uh, technical assistance and, and support. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I can't imagine not wanting to know what's going on with this work. I am so enamored by everything that happens with this group and by just the pure um, level of involvement the young women bring each cohort. Every cohort that I've gotten to meet virtually or in person, the girls are present, they are there, they have questions, they are so keen to learn more and do more. And I think that that is something, that's a space that is difficult to foster and it's done beautifully by this. Um, I know we have a couple participants on the line. I don't know if, if anyone has any questions for anyone, but this would be the time if you wanna, if you wanna ask, oh, I see a Q and A. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, from Monica. Do you have specific recommendations on replicating a program like this online given COVID? I'd really love to create a safe space for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color that connects colorism to criminalization and police brutality against Black folks, colorism in dating, reproductive justice, texturism, immigration, etc. Thanks, Monica, for the question. Yeah, that's that's a really great question, uh, Monica. And yeah, I, I, I think these are very intersectional issues that impact um, many of uh, people of color uh, and, and, and indigenous communities. And so I think um, 
you know, uh, you can use uh, the model that we have because we cover um, um, some of these issues within our cohorts. And so it's, it's a very similar to what you're trying to accomplish. So you can absolutely use the model that we have right now. And, and if I explain the model that we have is that uh, we have sessions. Um, so we have um, well-designed uh, curriculum-based sessions from wellness to leadership to uh, fi financial wellness and, and also mentor, mentorship. Uh, and then also in, in sessions, we intentionally invite women of color who are expert in these some of these topics, topics that we know we cover, but we also intentionally invite other women to talk about some of these issues that they're expert on. Some One of the example is that women who are uh, in, in political office like Ilhan Omar, or a representative Hodan Hassan, who are from the Somali communities who are in, in political office to talk about the advocacy and, and how did they even become, uh, 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 you know, elected officials and things like that. But also having, um, you know, meditation, you know, like and yoga guidance, somebody to come and talk about all of this, because unless we have that wellness, we can't even address these um, you know, like colorism and racial issues that are so impactful. And so having uh, them uh, go through all of these wellnesses, but also these other issues that are impacting them. We also have lawyers that talk about legal issues and, 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 you know, like when police stops them, what should they do? You know, like things like that to really prepare them, you know, for this world. So I think, uh, uh, you, you can absolutely uh, use the same model that we have in it's and it's on our website I'll, I'll post the website here now, so you can always uh, check out if you have questions, uh, you can uh, contact us myself or Fatih. Fatih, you can add to. Yeah, I would just add two points, one of them is the importance that it's participatory um, and including the community that you're serving within the process. Um, so like Amiri talked about doing um, focus groups with the parents, um, talking with the girls about exactly what do they want to get from this program. Um, at the beginning of each new cohort, we talk with the girls about what they would like to learn, what they would like to get from the program. So it's very much like things that the community thinks is important and specifically the population that we want to reach, um, African girls and have, having them participate in the process of creating the program, of what we cover, of how it goes. Um, and so I think that's important. Another part also is involving people that are in the community inside um, a part of the program. So both me and Amira are from the East African community. We speak Somali and that's really important, particularly with connecting with the parents, but then also for the girls to see us as well. So I think having representation from the community you wanna serve within the program is important and having a participatory model. Thank you, Monica, for that question. And um, Amira and Fati have dropped the website and their email addresses into the chat to all attendees. Um, and I know we're at time, but I just wanna say thank you so much to Justice Now for hosting this, this panel. And thank you to those of you who attended. And finally, Amira, Fati, Tiwange, Safia, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with me. I feel inspired just as I do every time I talk to the folks who are part of this program. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arbrita. And just now also thank you so much for giving us this space, this national platform to share um, uh, the work uh, that we do and the work that these amazing young girls, uh, Sophia and Twenge have been uh, doing. So thank you. Thanks, Arbrita, for moderating this session. Uh, thanks, Fatih. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye.